Hey everyone, welcome and thank you for joining us today for our interview with Olympians Katie Ray Esbury and Nick Kay. Uh, we'd like to just thank Basman New South Wales and our co funded organisation of the New South Wales government for their support in us bringing this today. How exciting is the fact that this time next year we will be hosting the FIBA World Women's Basketball World Cup in 2022 in Sydney. We hope that one of these Olympians today will be there and representing Australia again. I'd like to introduce our host for today's interview, none other than the boy from Gloucester, New South Wales and 2016 Olympian Damien Martin. Damien was the junior Australian under 20s captain of the 2003 FIBA World Champions. He is gold medalist at the 2018 Commonwealth Games, six time NBL champion, NBL grand final MVP, six time NBL best defensive player, and all NBL first team representative. The saying goes defense wins championships. Well, Damien is a true testament to this. He is no doubt at present the greatest all-time defender in NBL history. And it's an honor to have you with us today, Damo. Over to you, buddy. Ah, oh, no, thanks a lot. As a, a no-brainer when uh, Adam, Adam and I go way back, we were former teammates and rivals uh, growing up in country New South Wales. Good old Gloucester v. Lithgow Lasers. It's the Lasers, isn't it? Is that right? That's, That's right, mate. That's right. No, a couple of left-handers, at least one of us could shoot, so I won't say who that was because I'll embarrass myself. And to see Tamworth born and bred Nick Kay down there, all he does is text me every single day with a photo of the bronze medal saying, you never got one of these. And then uh, Kate is an absolute superstar uh, for the Opals, and I'm glad she never challenged me in a one-on-one when she played out in Perth because she would have absolutely smashed me. So it's uh, a privilege to be amongst some of Australia's best players and all the juniors out there tuning in, thanks a lot for getting involved. I absolutely miss uh, Gloucester. Oh, I miss Gloucester. I miss New South Wales. And some of the best times in basketball I ever had were from my junior days growing up in country New South Wales. So it's not about me at all today. I'm just here to host uh, and ask some questions that have been sent in. So I'll, I'll get straight into it with some of the questions that have come through on social media. And then if there's any answers that Nick or Katie give, I might try and get them to elaborate or have a few follow-up. So bear with me, but I hope you're all doing well. Good luck with your basketball. And I can't wait to see you out there representing Australia one day out of country New South Wales or New South Wales in general. First question I've got. So we'll start with uh, you, Katie, because you've been to two Olympics. Uh, During a major competition or tournament like the Olympics, do you find it stressful to look at social media or is there a ban on it altogether? That's a good question. Um... I do personally find it a little bit stressful to have social media. So I know um, in Rio and then again in Tokyo, I delete all of my social media apps. And again, this is something that's um, quite personal to me and isn't a team requirement by any stance or um, any standards like that. That's just, just a personal decision to delete them. I just find that I have people messaging me um, and it's a little bit distracting or having a look at what other people are posting or or waiting to see what people comment on my posts and things like that. So I just kind of remove the distractions altogether and and delete all those social media apps um, while I'm at big tournaments, especially. I think that's great. Uh, I'll throw over to Nick because Nick loves posting a photo of he and his fiance. So how do you go with the social media stuff? during uh, tournaments when everyone seems to want to reach out, whether it's good, bad or ugly, and it can be quite distracting. How do you go with it, Nick? You could unmute yourself, mate. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's definitely distracting. I, I leave it on just because, as you say, a lot of people reaching out and stuff and love to get back to people and that, but um, it's just about trying to find that balance for me. Um, can't spend too much time on the phone, especially when you're trying to prep for the games and stuff, but. Um, I also like to use it as a bit of motivation too. Obviously, it's you're not always going to get positive feedback and stuff, but um, it's good to be able to go out there and try and play your best and do that kind of stuff and um, use it to really get yourself going and motivated for the next one. 
Yeah, and I'll elaborate a little bit about the social media just for the juniors out there. I remember even at the senior level with the Wildcats, we had a player who I won't name was going through a bit of a form slump. And when I got to the bottom of it, it turns out he was reading a lot of the social forums about basketball. And it was really affecting him when he was playing well. Everyone loved him and was speaking highly about him and praise, praising him. Then he started to lose and we're going, he was going through a bit of a form slump and they started to question him as a player, as a person, so on and so forth. And, and one thing I've learned is when you win a game, they credit the players. When, when they lose, they blame the coach. But the voices that put themselves out there shouldn't matter. The voices in the room are the ones that matter. Your, your teammates, your coaches. And you're never as good as someone says you are after a win and you're never as bad as they say you're after a loss. So I remember reading somewhere that, you know, never take critic accept criticism from someone you wouldn't go to for advice. So you know who you respect the opinion of and just keep it to that. And you don't lose skill overnight, but you can lose confidence and confidence can affect skill. So try and keep it to your inner sanctum of coaches, players, family, whoever it might be that you love and try to avoid the voices of the others. And just quickly, when it comes to Olympics, I'm not sure if it's changed since Rio to um, Tokyo, but I know that on social media, you're not allowed to advertise anything because the people who sponsor the Olympic Games, if they see you advertising a conflict, you can get in big, big trouble. So I know, uh, I think Matisse Thibel in particular had to edit some things because he was sponsored by Nike. He didn't realise the rule. And then obviously uh, the Australian team had a different sponsor. So all of a sudden there's a little blur on all the Nike symbols when he, when he showed it. So there's pretty funny rules out there as well. Uh, next question. How have you dealt with online trolls or criticism on social media and any advice you might give? Because even at your age, but for some of the best players in the world, there is negative feedback out there and obviously it can be personal at times. We'll go with you, Katie. Um, I mean, you know, there's always going to be feedback. I think um, elaborating on what Damo said is that I just try and I keep, you know, the feedback that I want to get is people from that I trust um, and that is coaches and teammates and that's the, the feedback that I, I really gravitate towards rather than some person I don't know that's on an internet forum commenting about basketball, you know, I try and remove, um, remove that kind of feedback from my life so I don't read uh, I don't really read newspaper articles after a game. I don't. I don't go onto online forums. That's definitely a no-no. Um, I think that I can get into a, a really bad spot if I do that kind of stuff. And I read feedback, whether it's positive or negative. I think it can just kind of get you a bit too high or a bit too low. So, in order to kind of maintain a little bit of a level playing field in my own uh, mental health and, uh, and confidence. I try and just keep it to receiving feedback from people that I trust and have my best interests at heart. Um, and that is always usually your coach and your teammates, like I said, or your family. Um, and I try and remove those outside kind of voices because in the scheme of things, they don't really matter uh, and they don't kind of impact whether you can play basketball or not. All that matters is, is you and how you feel about yourself and, and where you get your feedback from is a really big factor in that. So I try and remove those outside, um, those outside factors for sure. Yeah, I love that. Hey, you, Nick, you had a bit of a different journey. Obviously, all the hype when you go to America is can you, you know, play at a Division One school? You move from Tamworth to Sydney to focus on high school and basketball. Go to a D two school, and now you're going to go on to be one of our all time greats. What was the the setbacks you might have had as a a young player and then kind of proving all the critics wrong, essentially. I guess it's um, when you're not at big name schools or anything, it's always trying to make sure you're involved in things, you're being seen, you're doing the right thing. And um, I guess it's not always an easy thing coming from the country either. It's, you know, um, a lot more, you're seeing a lot more in the city and stuff. Um, I guess the opportunities aren't necessarily as great. So it's about when you get the opportunities, making sure you're doing the best you can, um, doing all those things you, you do well and trying to make the most of it because um, the harder you work and stuff, the better it's going to pay off for you in the long run. And um, it, might not just, it might not be the first time you go for things. I don't think I made a country team or anything till 18. So there's a lot of setbacks trying to get to that point. And um I guess it kind of just added more motivation to keep pushing, keep trying to get there. And I guess all those uh, misses leading up to it was a big reason why now I've been able to kind of take that next step and learn from all those and get to where I am now. Absolutely. And hard work. I can vouch for, for both Nick and Katie. I've seen both of them train when they're in Perth, but 
everyone gets better during allocated time slots. Uh, all the players are there getting motivated by coaches and, and their peers, but it's those who stick around and work on the game every day outside of those times. And Nick was, you know, one of the hardest workers I've ever had as a teammate. There are a few questions that have come through. I'm not very good with technology, but I've managed to find them. So just to throw to one of the, the live questions, who are both of your favourite or who's your favourite teammate of all time? Nick, we'll start with you first. Goodness. Uh, I'm on the spot. Um, I mean, probably the easiest player to play with would have to be Bryce, the way he gets other guys involved and stuff. Um, his ability just to create so much help and get other guys open is unreal. But uh, I'm going to give Nordo a shout out to the man's been unreal to play with. He's so unselfish, the way he plays defense and stuff. And I spent so much time with him. So give Nordo a shout out for uh, being a good bloke. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure Mitch Norton, a proud Queensland, is tuning into this right now. He wishes he got to wear the sky blue. He wishes he was involved. And, and Katie? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I would have to say Belinda Snell, probably. Um, I grew up idolising Snelly, and uh, she's one of the most amazing shooters I've ever seen and ever had the opportunity to play with. So um, you could know for sure that as soon as she put up a three-point shot that it was going in and it made my job a a bit easier because I could just run back to the other end. Uh, but no, she's definitely one of the best. And I would say Jenna O'Hay as well, our Opals captain at the moment. She's um, just an amazing teammate. She does all those unselfish things that you you really love in, in certain teammates. So um, those are two of the best, most likely. Uh, that's on. And Jenna, what some clutch threes, threes she hit as well. Uh, and then a follow-up question. Going off the, the training hard, Emma Powers asked, how often would you train? What type of training hours do you put in? So we'll go start with you here, Nick. Yeah, obviously, um, you've got a lot of dedicated hours with team and stuff. Um, most days, you're probably in there from anywhere from seven till one. Um, and during that time, you want to try to get your own work in and stuff as well. But it's also those hours when you're away from the court um, whether you're getting an extra gym session in or whether you head back in in the afternoon and get some shots. So um, I think especially when you're younger, doing that extra work when you got the chances because you're not, um, you don't get as many team trainings necessarily. So heading in, getting extra shots with friends or playing a bit of one-on-one -on -one or three-on-three -three and stuff's the best way to be and the best way to go about it, I think, personally. And Katie? Um, I think, yeah, the later years of my career, I've definitely aimed to get maybe three or four extra kind of shooting or skills workouts. Um, being a, a, a guard and a shooting guard, I've, that's something that I really had to, I had to put the time into. Um, it wasn't enough for me to just turn up to three or four team trainings a week. I wasn't getting the stuff I needed to get in personally to improve my skill set to become a better player. So that needed to happen either 30, 40 minutes before a training session started or after, or it's going in and doing uh, some sessions or workouts in the morning, uh, either before school or uni, um, in order to get that extra work in. And so for me, it was, you know, working on my ball handling and then a lot of shooting and a different uh, kind of situational shooting and things that I needed to work on as, you know, a point guard and a shooting guard and, and shots I was going to get in games. And so they're not things you can always work on in team session. So I definitely found once I put in the time away from or outside of team sessions that I, I improved as a player. And uh, it's sometimes hard to do that, but it might mean getting up a little bit earlier or getting to practice a little bit earlier or staying a little bit later, like Nick said. And um, that's where you find that you, you grow a lot more as a player, for sure. Yeah, and, and the thing I'll add to that is not everyone can get to a court. And I can see we've got a lot of young faces here. So if you're unable to drive to a court, simply bouncing a ball at home means you're getting better. You may not be aware of it, but if you're bouncing the ball for half an hour, working on a few skills at home, that builds up over the course of a week, the course of a month, the course of a year. And all of a sudden, your ball handling skills getting better and you haven't even driven to a basketball court. So just little things like that every single day. And, and the example I like to give, um, when I was growing up, I was really wanted to be a professional athlete. And then I finally got to sign on the dotted line for West Sydney. Went to West Sydney, had two years there. It was a lot of fun. Technically, I was a professional athlete. But more than better than being a professional athlete is trying to be an elite athlete. Moving to Perth, I saw an elite athlete in uh, Sean Redditch. So Sean did all the cliche one percenters you've probably heard of previously. 
He got to weights early, lifted hard. He did stretching, got to training. He worked on his game before training, trained hard during the two and a half hours of team training. And then when he worked on his individual skill set for another 45 minutes, like Nick and Katie do as well. But then after that, it is, you know, stretching, ice bath, psychology, uh, diet was impeccable, got plenty of sleep. So every single one of those things he did every single day, not just when the media were there, not just after a loss, not just before finals. And over the course of a career, there's a reason he's gone to go on to be an Olympian and one of the all-time greats for the Wildcats. So my, my advice to anyone listening is don't just have a goal of trying to be professional at whatever it is you love. Try and be an elite at it. And it does mean doing something every single day to get better at it. Uh, next question from uh, going into it is, what do you think are the key benefits? We're going back to social media here, common theme. What do you think are the key benefits of social media? Does it outweigh the bad? And I'm going to follow that up with another one about social media that's been sent in, is how beneficial is your brand outside of basketball uh, to grow your business and persona online? So this will be the last thing we talk about, social media, but does it play any role in uh, who you are as people or your businesses or your uh brand or do you kind of pay minimal attention to it we'll go with you first katie um well as i've kind of mentioned i think social media isn't a really big uh, aspect of my life and that again is just a really big personal choice um i haven't used it as a part of a brand i don't necessarily have a, a brand per se um i've studied to be a a PE teacher so I have a career outside of basketball as well so I'm not really relying on basketball to be part of my brand as such so that's just a personal um, choice that I don't really use social media in that way so I don't know if Nick you can elaborate a little bit more on how you use it and maybe develop your brand. Go for it Nick. Yeah I'm not overly big on the brand thing either however I've seen the benefits to certain people um obviously being out in the public eye and stuff you've got a platform to use and you have the ability to um promote certain things or um benefit yourself in different ways whether it's endorsements or sponsorships and stuff and there's definitely some pros to it if you use it the right way um you obviously need to understand that there are a bunch of people looking at it and um you need to be respectful for the way you use it and the things you promote and stuff because um kids like yourselves are looking at it and you want to make sure you're promoting the right type of things. So um, best defensive there is some benefits, but you got to make sure you're doing it the right way. Think smart with it. Very good. And Nick, I've got a question for you. What was it like playing against the NBA guys? I mean, it was crazy. I mean, you're talking about social media and stuff and these guys are on your social media every day. They're making millions and millions of dollars and you're trying to guard them and, I mean, you idolise them growing up. They're the pinnacle of basketball in America and the NBA. And um, they definitely deserve it the way they play and the way they go about it. So it was a good challenge. It's fun. And I guess once you get on the court, that kind of all disappears, though. And it just becomes that battle of who wants it more. And, I mean, that's the fun of playing, playing sport. And a follow-up to that, you also got to play alongside a lot of NBA guys. Was there anything they did that you noticed was a common theme amongst the NBA guys that maybe – our juniors can uh, bring into their day-to-day -day approach to the game? Yeah, I mean, it just comes down to that work ethic again. Um, not just when they're at training, it's what they're doing away from the court. Um, I mean, Delhi, the way he goes about watching film, it's a couple of hours a day of watching the next team you play, the point guards, what they're doing, how they come off ball screens, all little things. And his ability to watch film, um, Paddy's diet, the way he is methodical in what he eats, when he eats, and um, his preparation. Um, Joe's confidence, the way he can just um, back himself in any situation and the way he just knows he's putting the work on the court. That he, when he gets to a game, he shoots the ball, it goes in. So it's all those little things that each player has and has developed over time to, um, to get themselves to that elite level. Hey, I'm going to put you both on the spot here with a question that's come in. Obviously, we're all proud to have come from New South Wales. We've got a lot of great coaches that we've had. Who are some of your favourite coaches uh, growing up and uh, even currently at the professional level? So, Katie, Newcastle girl, give me some of your coaches that you've had in the past. Um, I mean, my first ever rep coach was Jodie Doricott. Um, 
and she's still around the basketball stadium at the moment. I, you know, watched her son Jacob Doricott grow up and play for the Newcastle Hunters still. And Agnes Doricott, I don't know if anyone knows Aggie, but I know. yeah, yeah, she's <laughs> the Doricott for quite a famous Newcastle family. So those are those are some names that come to mind. I had Graham Baker um, as well in under 16 while I was at the Hunters and and Larry Davidson as a as a Newcastle Hunter in the ABA women's team as well. So um, quite renowned names in Newcastle and basketball New South Wales. And um, I was very lucky to be involved with um, those guys over the years and still am, which is really nice. Uh, it's a hold of this. Hello, I missed her. She was our first manager a long, long time ago. So no, she's amazing. And Nick, how about you? I mean, I should probably give Kaz a shout out first. She came to Tamworth and kind of, I guess, gave us that little uh, start into New South Wales country and stuff. So, um, yeah, definitely. We were used to go in there every Friday morning at like 7 a.m. in the tin shed and get some extra workouts in winter. And um, she definitely helped me kind of go to a different level in basketball. Um, guys like Rex Nottage and stuff who's still around, um, basketball in Sydney and Damien Cotter and stuff. Um, they were huge influences for me and big reason why I was able to go from Tamworth to Sydney and over to the States and still playing professionals because of the work they put in um, to me as a kid and helped me kind of take basketball from just a bit of fun to something you can make a career out of. Oh, brilliant. Uh, some great names mentioned there. Vicky Sams, I, I had her. She was brewing at Lake Macquarie, still one of the toughest coaches I've ever had. I was very spoiled. Yeah, Scotty, oh, Gallagher, yeah, you name it. There's some great coaches coming out of uh, New South Wales and they continue to do so. I've had a quick question come through. They've, I've been asked if you don't have a basketball hoop, this from uh, Emma, she doesn't have a hoop. Is there anything she can do to practice her skills apart from dribbling? So is there anything you can encourage Emma to do, even though she doesn't have a hoop? Uh, we'll go with you, Katie. Apart from dribbling? Was that apart well, you can work on defense. I know during the lockdown um, in Perth, I was literally practicing some defense and, and defensive slides in my driveway. Not not much fun, but you will get better doing such things. Um, not everyone likes to practice defense, but I will say that if you do, you do get better at it. So that's, you know, you can do some different directional changes with your defensive slides. There's a, there's a whole bunch of things you can kind of do um, with limited space as well. So that's one thing. I guess you can also improve your running or your sprinting, um, practicing change of direction as if you would running up and down a basketball court if you've got a bit of space. Um, so there's a couple of things I can think of besides dribbling. Very good. And I'm out of time. So Nick, I've got a question for you. Can you talk us through the moment the buzzer went and what it felt like standing on the podium? This is one of the questions that we sent in. Yeah, um, I mean, just how proud we were at that moment uh, to look over and see Patty and Joe hugging and, um, I mean, having Gorge and Nelly on the sideline, just these people that had been involved in the program for so long and the people that had reached out with support for us throughout the campaign to finally win that medal that we'd been chasing for so long. And it meant so much to so many people before. Um, I mean, you get back to that locker room and there's tears, the excitement going on. I mean, it's just indescribable how excited people were and how much it meant to not only us in the room, but everyone else that had supported us as well. So um, to actually be able to stand up on that podium at the end and, I mean, we had the mask on, but that smile under the mask was probably the biggest it's ever been. So, um, yeah, it was so cool and something I'll never forget. That is brilliant. And then a follow-up to, to that. This is for both of you. We'll start with you first, Nick. Uh, obviously, the next Olympics is only three years away. What are the plans moving forward? Is that already on the to-do list or are you just focused on, you know, the next couple of years before you think about three years' time? Yeah, a bit of both. Um, I always thought I'd probably just be a one and done type guy, but then once you kind of get there, you realize how special it is and what an environment it is. And it's just made me hungry to get to that next one. I want to do it again. So um, I always believe in taking care of each year as it comes and making the most out of that year. If you look too far ahead, you kind of miss the opportunity that's right in front of you. So I'm just going to try to make the most of this year and 
just keep building the best I can. So in three years' time or two years with the next World Cup, you're in the best position you can be trying to make that team. So, but um, yeah, I think it's just about each day trying to get better so that in, at that point you're uh, you're taking a huge step just um, with small steps along the way. What about you, Katie? Three-time Olympian has a nice bell to it. It's also a very long way away in <laughs> athlete terms. Um, no, I'm definitely kind of uh, a little bit of a few months ahead at the, at the moment and, and not looking too far ahead. So see how I go for another three years. Not sure yet. <laughs> not a problem. Uh, I'm going to try and get through a few of these questions quickly. Uh, hardest opponent of all time, Katie? Uh, I would say Diana Taurasi, um, one of the all-time greats in, in women's basketball and in basketball in general, um, an American, obviously. She's just um, ridiculously hard to guard and, and always manages to get you to foul her in some sort of way. So I don't know if that's her being good or the ref, not sure, but I would say she's probably the most difficult. And what about you, Nick? Hardest opponent? Yeah, I, I think mine's pretty simple. KD, um, just so big and so skilled. And I mean, there's a reason he's one of the best, if not best in the world right now. Have you ever met anyone that's maybe stolen the ball off KD? I don't know. I feel like someone fouled him and didn't get called for it, but... Uh, I think uh, Bass New South Wales is going to put up a clip of that immediately following this. So uh, we will see what happens. <laughs> Uh, Nick, do you have the medal on you? I've had a couple of people ask if you've got the medal on yeah, you. Yeah, give me two seconds. I was going to bring it out, but get on to the next one. Not a problem. Thanks, mate. Uh, Katie, we'll throw it back to you. Uh, can you elaborate to the juniors out there, kind of your pathway to where you currently are, starting from juniors, to any advice you have for people that, you know, want to just be playing professional basketball, but they might only be 10 or 12 right now? Oh, um, my pathway was I, I started playing rep basketball for the Newcastle Hunters when I was nine um, and then kind of progressed there into New South Wales country teams in under 16s and 18s and I moved down to the Australian Institute of Sport when I was 15 so um, and started playing in the in the WNBL from then on so um any advice? I think just, you know, keep playing and enjoying your basketball and, and having a good balance in your life. I think if you can spend a little time improving some of the skills that you might need to to uh, to go to the next level, then take that time and, and listen to your coaches and your family around you as well. Um, but I think for, for people that are kind of in the 10 to 12 age group, I would really say just try and enjoy basketball. It's really fun at this age and, and don't take it too seriously, but you can still enjoy it and put the work in at the same time. I think that's a really big thing to remember. So, yeah. That's great advice. Before Nick shows us off this medal, I'll elaborate on that because uh, you've mentioned family and friends and enjoying it, Katie. And, and one of the coaches and friends that Nick and I have uh, used to tell us he should play basketball for the two R's, rings and relationships. So trying to win, you know, championship medals like Nick's about to show us but also the relationships. So the day-to-day -day mateships you develop, the long-term mateships you develop uh, is just as important, if not more, than the, the medals you do win or you may go on to win. So, Nick, on that, can you show us, one, the medal, but secondly, what it was like being able to tell your parents or speak to your parents immediately following winning because it's not what you do in life, it's who you do it with. And I know your parents have been a huge part of uh, your journey in basketball. So show us that beautiful bronze medal and then maybe talk to us about the moment. Yeah. Got the medal here. She's got some weight to it. Beautiful though. Um, something that's nice and tucked away at home. Don't want to lose it or anything. But um, obviously that obviously calling your parents to make it Olympics is something special. Is I think a lot of people have heard you say that before, and it's one of those super proud moments. But then to get back into that locker room afterwards, and I mean, I only gave two quick phone calls: one to my fiance and one to the family, and they were both in. They were both in tears. They were so happy they'd been along for the journey for however long it's been now, and it meant just as much to them because they're the ones driving you to all the camps. Um, they're doing all these trips, sacrificing money and stuff to let you pursue, uh, pursue basketball. And um, I feel like that medal is theirs as much as it was mine. So it was cool just to be able to call them and celebrate that moment with them quickly. Yeah, I think you're spot on. 
Uh, and if there's any advice I can give, I remember being 15, mum and dad spending crazy amounts of time in the car. Um, my four siblings, you know, spending all their time in the car so I could pursue basketball. I can rarely remember saying thank, thank you. So don't forget to thank your parents, whoever might be driving around. It's a, a lot of sacrifices they make, but uh, hopefully they're rewarded with it as well. That's it for, uh, from us for our 30 minutes. I might hand it back to Adam to wrap it up, but to Nick and Katie. Love watching you guys play over there. Love watching you play around the world and uh, best of luck with your basketball. And Katie, I know you dodged it a little bit, but I definitely want to see you uh, in Paris. And, and Nick, I believe you'll definitely be there as well. So all the best with your basketball and to all the juniors out there paying attention. I can't wait to see you in the green and gold one day. But as Katie said, play it because you love it first and foremost. Adam. Okay, thank you so much, Katie, Nick and Damo for jumping in today.